introduce my guest, uh, Paul Zak. Paul is, is the founding director of the Center of Neuroeconomic Studies and professor of economic psychology and management at Claremont Graduate University. He is the founder and chief immersion officer of Immersion Neuroscience, the first neuroscience as a service platform. Paul's two decades of research have taken him from the Pentagon to Fortune 50 ballrooms and the rainforest of Papua New Guinea. All of this in a quest to understand the neuroscience of human connection, human happiness, and effective teamwork. And by the way, he doesn't say it in his bio, but he has a pretty spectacular TED talk on uh, oxytocin, trust, and morality. Um, you can give that a look. It's, it's uh, one you won't want to miss. His research on oxytocin and relationships has earned him the nickname Dr. Love. He's all about adding love to the world, which is why we love him. So thank you so much, Paul. Oh, I think we need to unmute you. There you we go. Need to unmute. What there a wonderful uh, introduction. Thank you so much. And you've set the bar so high now, so it's really got to be good. So. <laughs> Well, I've seen you perform, so I have no um, doubt that we're going to have a great conversation today. So before we get dive into our conversation, will you, um, Paul, tell the, everyone who's joined us today how they can participate in this Creating Experiences That Matter experience that we're co-creating today? Right. So we sent out an email to folks that um, invited you to download our app if you have a smartwatch, a supported smartwatch. And we'll actually collect some data and see how effective this podinar is. Uh, if y'all want to do that, uh, if you've already downloaded it, you need to push join on your watch. It's a little uh, blue. Uh, I don't know if you can see mine. It's a little blue. Uh, oh, it's a little blue uh, brain um, uh, icon, and uh, it should say join if you've already downloaded the app. If you haven't downloaded the app, you could probably do it while we're talking, but then you would lose our beautiful conversation. So if you've done that in advance, um, then uh, you're good to go. And we'll look at some of that data later. And uh, I'm a big believer in, uh, you know, science is about, sorry, I'm going to use one bad word, science is about getting rid of bullshit. So, uh, you know, <laughs> we're going to we're gonna actually do that on ourselves and make sure that we're actually creating a great experience for everyone here. Great. So Paul just... Uh... Um, Adrian just joined and said that, or maybe it's Andrea just joined and said she'd like the name of the app again. Uh, it's called Immersion Neuro. Let's see. Uh, there's, we have so many. <laughs> I've actually forgotten. It, it might be called Sense. You have to go to the link. So if you look at your email, oh, you've got thank a link you, to Sarah. It. Sarah's putting it Sorry. in the chat box. Uh, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, there we you have go. A, we have lots of different apps, so I've forgotten. No, it's, oh, thanks, yeah. Andrea. So, um, and also we sent out an email at two o'clock Eastern yesterday with the title, the subject title, Would You Like to Participate Tomorrow in Our Live Demonstration? So, so what Paul was talking about is this. Um, topic of creating experiences that matter isn't uh, just sure, surely conceptual. What the invitation to join us in demonstrating it is that we, we can help determine live right now how much this podinar matters. <laughs> and it means all of uh, any of you who have a smartwatch, I don't have a smartwatch. You have to have a smartwatch to participate. But any of you who have a smartwatch uh, then downloading the app and we'll look at your data. It'll all be, it's completely anonymous, anonymized. Um, and that'll give a sense for, for how engaged we are. Okay. So with that, can you tell us, Paul, what you mean by immersion neuroscience? All right. So uh, over 20 years of research in my lab, starting with, as Allison said, the work we did to understand um, this neurochemical oxytocin and what causes the brain to make it, what behavioral effects it has. We um, wanted to know if experiences uh, from movies to video clips to video conferences um, would it cause the brain to make oxytocin? And if so, how valuable is that experience? And value is complicated, right? I could ask you, but we know that it's very difficult to assess this kind of valuation decisions, right? So, like liking is a very poor predictor of what people actually do. I might like to lose 10 pounds this year, but if I really lost 10 pounds, that's objectively observable. So um, we designed experiments where we had people do something 
after we gave them an experience. And, and uh, originally we were doing blood draws. So we do before and after blood draws. And we would use, for example, a public service announcement. And then we said, okay, let's see if the oxytocin actually caused you to do something. Then we can actually see that it's not just background noise in your brain, number one. And number two, then we can assess how much you value that experience. So like uh, we did a lot of uh, PSAs for childhood cancer from St. Jude Children's Hospital. So if you donated St. Jude's, your brain must have valued this. And we found that oxytocin was not enough, that you had to have a second component, uh, which was you've got to really attend to the information. So if you're, if you're asleep, it's not gonna be a great experience. So if you're attending to it and you get the oxytocin response, which tells us that it's emotionally resonant, your brain really um, is engaged by this, it cares about it. When those things co-occur, I've called that state immersion. So this is kind of like um, why we cry at movies, uh, which you know is a very weird human behavior, right? You're cognitively intact, you know where you are, you, you know this is a fictional story, you know those are paid actors, and yet at the end of the movie when the boy gets the girl, people cry. But that's really interesting. So that's kind of a transportation of yourself into that experience. And that's what immersion is neurologically. It's that mechanism or set of mechanisms in the brain that cause us to transport ourselves into an experience. And here's the punchline. When we do that, we remember the experience, we enjoy the experience. You know, we can recall the information in that experience weeks later. So it uh, looks like somehow just by dint of hard work, we identified how the brain values an experience. And if we can measure that, then we can go back and create more valuable experiences. Okay, so if I can tease that out a little bit, what I think I'm hearing you say is that you're defining immersion as attention and the production of oxytocin. Did I get that right? Yeah, I would say attention and emotional resonance. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and emotional resonance is measured by oxytocin, oxytocin release? Yeah, or it's that sharing of emotion. So you might call that empathy, but um, because we also look at sort of static, non-human interactions, Empathy is a, a bit of an odd word to use for a movie, uh, but it's really how much I'm in sync with you. So here's kind of a cool thing else, and this may be the, the one useful piece of neuroscience I'll share today, which is if we're having a great conversation or if we're working together, our brains and our physiologies begin to coordinate. So immersion is really this uh, interaction between people. And again, if it's a movie, it's between me and the characters in the movie, but it's still the same mechanism of the brain. So if I can create an immersive experience, then we're working effectively as a team. Then we're in sync in a, in a very real neurologic way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So immersion and experiences that matter are, we're using those certain terms synonymously here. Is that right? Yeah, they run together. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So in all this work you've done in learning about immersive experiences, meaning it, it's an immersive experience in which there's attention and human connection. What have you learned that, that, creates attention and creates human connection? Uh, that's a big question. Um, let's narrow it maybe to the, to the training space. So um, uh, it's all public information. Uh, one of our longest term clients is Accenture and Accenture produces $1 billion of training annually for their employees. Awesome company, right? That's amazing. Lovely. They call this uh, future-proofing employees. And so they have this whole uh, a group of learning architect, architects based out of uh, St. Charles, Illinois, and they spend a lot of time uh, creating training, tweaking it, making it better, but it never has a metric other than that post-event survey that, you know, we talk about the hotel and the food, and it's hard to say, like, these 10 minutes of this experience, not so good or, or fabulous. Um, so they've been using our technology for about two years, and what they found was uh, that uh, what I call the 20-20-20 rule. So no one should present for more than 20 minutes. If, if it's really valuable, if it's immersive, if I'm really putting in metabolic energy to acquire this information or have this experience, then 20 minutes is about as long as you can uh, sustain attention. Um, so you were very nice to promote my uh, TED Talk. Um, so TED Talks are 18 minutes maximum, right? So somehow Chris Anderson and Ted sort of knew that that's, if it's really powerful, that's about enough. So Accenture does 20 minutes presentation and then 20 minutes of an active task for the learners and then 20 minutes of debrief. And, and something we've also seen in the Accenture data, uh, again, the, uh, they, they produce films on this. I mean, so this is all public information. So none of this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sharing uh, out of school here, but, uh, but they've also found uh, one of the learning arch architects at um, Accenture said this so, so beautifully. He said, Maslow's hierarchy always wins. 
So by that, they found that the breaks are really important. If you're, especially when you're in, in the Zoom world, but even in person, uh, if you're tired, if you need to use the bathroom, if you're thirsty, you know, that takes bandwidth out of your brain. And so it's just harder to really stay fully engaged. So they've actually put um, shorter, more intensive sessions and longer breaks. And that's sort of counter to what, um, you know, we think, hey, we're adults, we can work through eight hours of this information. But again, neurologically, um, as you'll see when we look at the immersion data, it's always kind of a sine wave. If I'm deeply immersed in experience, it's really metabolically costly. And then I need to take a little neural breath. I need to actually just, uh, neurons get fatigued like muscles do. So I need to have a little break and then I can kind of re-immerse. Um, and so I think having that data allows you to really kind of go back and audit what you've done before. Say if you did a video of that experience, you can just overlay the data, but also think about how we have the, the most impact on humans uh, in terms of how we train them, how we engage with them so that the experience we're creating has long-term effects. So the 2020 learning you got from uh, Accenture, was that based on in-person training or virtual? And if it was based on in-person, do you think it would be the same or different for virtual? Great question. Um, that was based on in-person. And what they've told me recently for virtual is much more like 10 minutes of presentation <laughs> I was afraid yeah, you were gonna before say that. <laughs> we do something. No, but, but you know, you, I mean, we, so you guys, we, we rehearsed this in advance. We have a plan. The Allison has a plan. And, um, you know, I think taking those breaks for questions, mixing it up. Uh, we even see that for longer presentations for all of us probably do presentations. If you're doing an hour long keynote or something, mix up the media. I show videos, I show, you know, or move, use the stage, right? Move around, mix things up, go in the back of the room. I've, I've, I've done talks in the back of the room just because I want to, you know, mess people's brains up. So, you know, really use that space fully, all the tools that you have. So I'm thinking about how I apply this. You know, we're, we're a training company. We have you know, a, a 12 week long, well, virtual, a 12 week long course. We meet for 90 minutes and I'm just thinking, and, and I imagine many of the people who are joining us today also do some form of training or workshopping or whatever online. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if I had to do like 20, 20, 20, or like 10, 10, or like something like that, I'm like, it'd have to be a 24 week workshop. You know, I, I, um, I, do you have an idea of like what this means in terms of how we really need to like completely reimagine training? Yeah, I, I, I think the beautiful thing about online is it just scales, right? So we can reach a lot more people. Um, uh, so I think it's really breaking things into smaller chunks and then, and then as much as possible being more participatory. So when, when we're in person, we, you know, we always know we need to do participatory tasks. And I think it takes a lot of creativity to think about how to do that in the online world. But for example, breakout rooms are a great way to do that in Zoom. Um, and so really put that in and, and allow um, attendees to voice what they're doing. Um, so I think it's, it's more, um, it's, it's like a flipped classroom kind of thing as much as possible. Okay, well, given that, and we've been going I'm by my clock 16 minutes now, <laughs> we should do something. <laughs> you know what, I'll, I'll give you two suggestions, which, yeah. which I've seen done recently. I'm sorry if I cut you off, Allison. No. One is um, I did a, a keynote in Brazil, in Brazil yesterday via Zoom. And instead of doing, uh, for a group I had done a, um, an hour keynote for last year. And um, Brazilians love me for some reason. We can talk about that on the side. Uh, <laughs> and so instead of doing me talking, they did an interview style. So they had both me and the interviewer on screen and we basically did an interview. So it's much more back and forth. So I thought that was a great idea. Um, the second is something Accenture has done now is after about 15 to 20 minutes, take a physical break and actually have people exercise. Let's stand up, let's move around, uh, go, you know, just get some blood flowing. I, I, you know, it seemed to work really well. Uh, I did an Accenture webinar, Accenture webinar about um, maybe six weeks, seven weeks ago. And I was like, oh, okay, we're, we're gonna move around for three minutes, but three minutes ain't bad. So um, you're the boss of us, so you can decide if we wanna do that or not. Yeah, but, I um, mean, how about we just take maybe 60 seconds and move and then we'll like see how it goes, 60. What do you think? All right, I love it. Maybe head and shoulders. Awesome. We'll do, I can do head, shoulders, knees yeah. and toes. Okay. Sure, let's do it. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. <laughs> 
eyes and ears and a mouth and a nose. I think I got that wrong. Head, <laughs> shoulder, knees and toes, knees and toes. That's pretty good. And, yeah. And we also touched on something else, which uh, we're going to talk about, Allison, in our, our schedule, with, which is vulnerability, right? So when we're in person, you know, we, we're sitting close to each other, you know, uh, shoulder to shoulder, but we don't have that kind of physical connection. But now we just do something stupidly goofy together, and it's a little <laughs> yeah. bit embarrassing. It's wonderful <laughs> to be vulnerable. So we've actually found in laboratory experiments that individuals who are vulnerable, who open up, Oh, you get a big oxytocin release. We really like these people. So, yeah, you know, be a little silly. Be, uh, it's okay. We get it. You know, bring your dog in or your kid. Or I think it's so lovely when you're doing a Zoom and someone's, you know, child walks into the screen and, oh, hey, how are you? You know, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, how about we stop for a second and take questions from our audience. If you would like to ask a question, uh, feel free and raise your hand, raise your virtual hand. Let me see how I can see you. If you'd like, you can find your virtual hand under the participants button. Um, I will ask a couple of questions that were um, offered in advance while I watch, while we watch for the virtual hands. Wayne asked the question, what sections of the brain are most active, like when we're you know, immersed? Right. So, um, great question. So, first of all, um, uh, all those false images you've seen from functional MRI are false. So, those they're, those are just you know, changes in 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 uh, activity. So, the whole brain's working all the time. So, some somehow that question, um, what's most active, uh, you know, is it's not quite Correct, but the whole brain's working all the time. There's no hard line between cognition and emotion. Uh, if you read Danny Kahneman's book, you know the system one and system two is a myth. It's your whole brain. It's like your heart's organized. It's, you know, it's not, it's a it's an organ that works all together. Having said that, what we found is that the neurochemicals associated with immersion are primarily dopamine and oxytocin. So dopamine, particularly binding in the prefrontal cortex, so attention is very uh, active in the prefrontal cortex, and oxytocin comes from the brainstem. So what does that mean in, in application? It means I've got to get enough kind of executive uh, focus. Uh, so I you know, get rid of distractions so I can really focus on this experience. So that's the necessary condition to be immersed. But the sufficient condition is, uh, again, I'm, now I'm going to use a second bad word with apologies, but it's sort of a bad word. Um, as one of our clients said, it's the give a shit measure. So this emotional resonance is you've got to make me care about this. So learning, again, is metabolically costly. It's hard to do. So you've got to capture my attention, number one. But most of the variation in immersion is due to this emotional resonance, how much I care second to second about this. And if you can get me to care about it, then I'm going to get this oxytocin and dopamine response where I'm, I'm kind of all in. And that's what you want. And again, all in is not a, it's not a zero one variable. It's, you know, varying. Um, but once you again, for me as a nerdy scientist, once you have a measurement tool, then you can really ask interesting questions. How do I reverse engineer this process? so that I can have maximum impact on the people I'm interacting with. So thank you for that question. Awesome. Yeah. So Ellen, I see you've got a question. And you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Cool. I put it in the chat too. I'm just wondering if you can then rinse and repeat. So if you've done your 20, 20, 20, so you've finished a debrief, can you then you know, add more content, another 20, and do the whole thing again? I think I would put a break in. I would put a 10-minute break and then come back. I think it is wash, rinse, and repeat. Um, so yeah, uh, and, and uh, other people have asked, like, um, what if I, you know, do the same content for, for 10 different audiences? Like, do I have to mix it up? Actually, no. So even when we looked at people watching the same content online, if it's immersive content, you'll enjoy it again. This is like the TV show or movie that you've seen 10 times, right? We can, we still enjoy it. We still become immersed in it. Um, and sometimes it's more enjoyable the second or third time through. Uh, Sarah, any questions we should take from the chat box? Um, Adrian is asking, what's the impact on focus of attention and impact on coaching conversation in comparison with training activity? Uh, I don't have a good answer for that. I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I could get to the neuroscience, um, but I, I, I'm not, a, I, I don't know the differences enough. You guys maybe could tell me, maybe, um, Okay. You could inform me more about the difference between coaching and training. Yeah, it's a good question. I would think 
that coaching is much more or training is much more passive and impersonal and coaching is much more uh, active and and personal uh so that i think the my my sense is that there'd be more attention and more connection in coaching but that's just what's coming up for me yeah i see peter has a question how does this work with uh, i lost the question Oh, I see. Well, people who trigger anger and fear in others to gain followership. Oh, such a good question. In fact, we're going to talk about this in our third half hour. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, so the precursor for building that connection, that trust in this other person, particularly in the one-to-one -one coaching, thank you, Allison, for explaining that to me, is um, what we call psychological safety. So I've got to be comfortable around this person. I've got to build that connection. Um, and so... Um, Fear is a really great short-term motivator. Uh, it's a very poor long-term motivator. So the term of art in psychology for repeated unexpected fear responses, uh, the behavioral response is called learned helplessness. So if I'm, I'm a rat in a cage, I'm getting shocked randomly, I just give up. And humans do the same thing, they just, pfft. so I've had the yelling boss and maybe you guys have too. I hate the yelling boss. I think it's a very, first of all, I think, this guy, it's always a guy, sorry. This guy cannot emotionally regulate. Like, dude, I'm a high performer. Like, I will get this stuff done. Don't yell at me. Right? Have some control of your life, number one. And then number two, right, that, that the yelling generates a, a defense of a fear response. So again, if I'm in fear response, I'm going to react quickly, but it narrows my focus. I'm looking at just getting through the next 10 minutes, not about the bigger picture, not about our OKRs, not about the organization's goals. Um, so conversely with oxytocin, this kind of connection, empathy, getting me to care about something, there's good evidence that that system not, so, so the fear system downregulates, the oxytocin system upregulates. If I say, look, I really care about you. I want you to be successful in everything we do. And I think for me, when I've done, I, I wouldn't call myself a coach, but when I've done, you know, working with our organizations and clients, um, I always think about those individuals as being successful as human beings before they're successful as employees. Right, you've got to hex if, if your personal life sucks, but you're the best, I don't know, salesperson, you're at some point you're gonna blow up, right? It's just that's the way people work. So really think about the whole person and think about them being successful. I'm sure you guys do the same thing. Um, and so if I show you that care, if I'm coaching you, if I show you that I really am interested in you as a human being, then we build a strong connection and then I can help move you to places you want to go. Um, so it's a little like therapy, right? You've got to kind of trust that therapist. Or, or, a, or a romantic relationship, you know, you build that trust with that person and they may, you know, they may take you to places that are a little uncomfortable, but you can get used to it if you're there. So the last point, sorry for the long answer, but it's such an important question. Um, if, if I'm doing training, one-on-many training, and I don't establish psychological safety, um, you can think of psychological safety as kind of the inverse of anxiety. So if I'm anxious, I'm taking a lot of bandwidth just to try to, you know, not I don't know, explode, you know, uh, psychologically. So if, if I don't establish psychological safety from the get go, then it's going to be really hard to make that connection. Have you care about what's going on? Because you're worried about, I don't know, you know, something else in your life um, or, or, or I'm just being an absolute ass and I'm not right. So uh, again, I think the long-term play is building connection and there's very good evidence for this uh, organizational performance and lots of other measures. So um, anyway, um, yeah, that's a great, great question. We can spend an hour on that easily. Yeah. So, Paul, what are the the best practices for creating psychological safety virtually? I mean, particularly like we're in situations where we sometimes need to have meaningful conversations with maybe people we've never met before. In 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 particularly, maybe I don't know if it's different one on one or two with a group. But how does one create psychological safety virtually say with people we don't know well yeah I, I think the the um i think we're still figuring that out we, we meaning the you know scientific community or or even the training community um but a couple of things which is will not surprise you the things we do in person right so we walk in a room a bunch of new people here and then we do that um do you know this this person Oh, you work for um, Accenture? Oh, yeah. Do you know Bob? Yeah, man, my friend Bob used to work for them or still works for them. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. So that, that kind of chit chat, which, which sounds like it's kind of a weird waste of time on Zoom. 
how are you? And, uh, but it builds that sense of connection. So now all of a sudden, instead of being a stranger, we have one degree of separation. We know someone in common. And so building that in, what I try to do is to, to make an emotional connection. So I would say, hey, Sarah, are you okay? You look a little tired today. How are things going? So really opening up that emotional space, which you can do with strangers. It's, I mean, if you are authentic and you really mean it, you can just do that. I call emotional check-in. Just do an emotional check-in. And certainly with people you know, it's easier. Um, but I'm, I'm maybe old enough or weird enough that I, I'll just do it with strangers. Like many uh, on any kind of Zoom, like, you know, are you okay? You look a little, you look a little uh, sad today, There's something going on. So here's an example. I, I did an interview um, about a month ago with a journalist um, and um, she just looked sad to me. And, and, I, and I said, are you all right? Because you, you look a little bit, I'm just kind of worried about you. And she goes, you know, this, this pandemic thing, I've been, um, you know, sheltering at home for all these times. I said, do you live by yourself? She said, yeah. I said, tell me about that. And she said, well, don't you want to interview? I said, no, let, let's, let's work on this first. And, and she basically said, if I didn't have my cat, I think I would have gone insane. I think it's really oh. hard when you're single and you're not living with anybody and she was uh, far from her family. And so we had a nice 15, 10 minute conversation about that. And then we established that psychological safety. I think her anxiety went down, just normal life anxiety that had nothing to do with me. So, you know, that to me was a great investment in having a much better experience for both of us because she was able to just kind of de-stress a little bit. Yeah, nice. So Kanush, I see you've got a hand up. Yes, thank you very much, Alison and Paul. So uh, uh, my background is, a, is an MD, so I'm a physician. And I remember from my internship years that uh, I had a patient that, uh, that we needed to, uh, to use the oxytocin for the induction. So they are going to sure. labor using the hormone oxytocin. So I was just wondering, is it the side effect of too much oxytocin? And do we physiologically have a way that to have it in the body? And what are those side effects? Wonderful question. Um, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, we've done a lot of work with psychiatric patients to address that issue. Um, so oxytocin is made from very uh, nine very uh, abundant amino acids. So you basically don't run out of the precursors. Um, what we found is that almost any positive social stimulus will cause the brain to release oxytocin. It's got a very short half-life, about three minutes. Um, and um, uh, everyone, uh, including uh, criminal psychopaths that we've tested and as Allison said in the intro, uh, uh, people living in the rainforest of Papua New Guinea appear to re release oxytocin on stimulus. We find that psychopaths, uh, which are about 2% of the population, and um, people who uh, have faced a lot of trauma, particularly uh, trauma victims as children, is that uh, this, the uh, receptors become dysfunctional. So oxytocin is really, sorry, maybe too much information, but uh, she and I would just talk. So, uh, you know, uh, you make oxytocin, but it has no effect biologically because the receptors have, have become damaged or dysfunctional. Um, and so I think the takeaway for all of us is that you're gonna get a couple percent of the population who are, who are um, just not gonna respond well to you. And some of those people have, are having a really bad day. So as I said, anxiety, uh, so um, epinephrine, norepinephrine for my uh, neuroscience friends are big inhibitors to oxytocin release. So if I'm really under stress, enormous stress, I'm not going to be able to reach out very effectively. Um, and, the, and the second is, you know, the psychopath. So we've spent, uh, my group has spent time in, in prisons uh, measuring um, oxytocin release and behaviors of criminal psychopaths, and they classically lack empathy, right? So, and they, they have a dysfunction oxytocin, um, both in the release of oxytocin, but primarily in the receptors. Um, so 2% of the people you're not going to be able to make progress with. And, um, but 98% you can. And so again, for that couple percent, you know, who are just having really bad days, I think it is important, at least as a neuroscientist, I think it's important that we don't commit the fundamental attribution error and say, I don't know, Sarah's nasty to me once in a while and say, oh, she's a bad person, you know, as opposed to, hey, I wonder if she's having a bad day because she's always been really nice to me. And today, this one time, I don't want to jump to that conclusion. I'd rather inquire, are you all right? Are things going okay? But you really seem stressed out today. Let's talk about that. Um, so anyway, yeah. So it looks like you can't run out. And here's the last thing. Sorry, such a good question. You guys are so smart. Um, that um, the more you release oxytocin, the more you become sensitized to it. So we actually become more empathic, better connectors over time. Um, and by the way, it won't surprise you. In every experiment we've run in 20 years, thousands of thousands of people who releases more oxytocin on average, women rather than men. Yeah. 
So, Paul, we're halfway through our conversation. Is there, do you, do you want to, I wasn't sure how we were going to do this. Do you want to show the data of where we are so far? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. I'll do it. I'll do a screen share cool. and pull it up. Um, I think y'all can see it here. So, um, so here's the data. It's running in real time. Looks like we've got seven people who are uh, collecting data. This is rescaling. This spike was our exercise, actually right after our exercise. Uh, so I put a marker in here that says exercise over. So um, yeah, so it looks like that exercise break really worked, allowed us to just have a little reset. Uh, this is when Alex and we started talking. Uh, so I started the data collection a little earlier. And um, yeah, here's where we are now. So when this uh, data collection is over, uh, it'll it'll present a bunch of uh, metrics that identify not only how good it is. So immersion runs zero to ten, so it's uh, linear. So uh, benchmark is four, so right around benchmark, which is fine. And it'll also quantify these mountaintops, like what were the peak immersion moments that we call wow. What, you know, so if we we rec oh we are recording this probably. You must be recording this. Yeah, we, we can are. go back mm -hmm. and yeah. What, what, why don't you and I do that, Allison, offline? We can just go back and see. Hey, what were those really high immersion moments? What did people love the most? And then we can look at some of these valleys and go, okay, what, you know, what sort of didn't work so well? Um, so, yeah. Uh, any questions on that, you guys? I'm sorry, I'm yeah, no, talking it's over everybody. Yeah, let's ask uh, questions. Let me see if I can. And thanks for the people who participated, by the way. So, uh, hope, hope it's kind of fun. You'll get feedback on your smartwatch, by the way, as soon as it's over. I was playing wrestling with my dog today. That's a bandage. <laughs> who won? <laughs> I think he did. He did <laughs> so Bonnie's asking how the feedback is collected. It's 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 from your the smartwatch, right? Yeah. So there's a trick there. This is a twenty year trick. Trick, you know, uh, which is um, we uh, basically had millions of dollars of taxpayer money. We did a lot of this work uh, for the U.S. military and U.S. intelligence community who want to understand how people respond to experiences, and we measured. Uh, 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 central brain activity of uh, the brain and the peripheral nervous system simultaneously. And then we basically traced out these pathways from the nerves that innervate your heart and your gut, which I can get from here, back to the brain. So then we wrote algorithms that let us infer what the brain's doing from these very subtle changes in the cranial uh, nerve activity. Um, and so, yeah, so it just took a long time. All this is published. If you Google Scholar Me, you can pull up a bunch of papers and see. Um, not the algorithms, but everything else. And then doing it in real time was hard and, you know, cloud computing and blah, 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 blah. So it's going from watch to cloud to the platform that I showed you. Um, but yeah, it just took a long time to figure out all the details. It's cool, though. It's super cool. Thank yeah. You. So one of the things we talked about in, a, in our previous conversation was the, the impact of, of storytelling on attention. Will you, will you speak to that? Gosh, yeah. So we started using, as I said earlier, short videos to see if we could release uh, oxytocin in humans, as opposed to in-person interactions. They're less controlled. And uh, that, that's how we kind of got onto this notion of neurologic immersion. Um, but as we looked at those videos, they had a narrative arc. I mean, pe you know, people produce these videos. We, we pulled them off the web somewhere. And um, what we found was that storytelling is a very effective way to immerse people in uh, a piece of information. It's almost the most effective way we found. So, so what, what does that mean? It means having a narrative arc in which I introduce characters with a mystery. Hey, something's happening here. I uh, generate tension and it should be authentic tension, not, not manufactured tension, but real people having a human scale story where real people are having a, a kind of a tension or crisis and then have that crisis resolved. And that, that narrative arc uh, the immersion will almost track that. Again, not in a straight line, it'll be wiggly. Um, so it's a really effective way to transmit information. And so I feel like the scales fell from my eyes after a couple of years of studying this, that um, storytelling is really, really effective. Even though uh, as a super nerd, like many of you, I wanna have slides and data, I always wanna start with a story. So I think that human scale story is what our brains are kind of built to connect to. And in addition, if you tell that story or relate that story effectively, then you're going to get that halo effect where that audience will connect to you as well. Nice. So not to put you on the spot, but so what's the best story you tell? Yeah, I think that there's a, a variety of good stories. Um, again, you guys can Google me later. And there's a nice animated video of uh, work we've done with St. Jude Children's Hospital about a uh, father 
who's got a two-year-old son dying of brain cancer. And uh, it, it, it's, it'll make you cry. It's so sad. And these are real people. These are not actors. This is a real kid who died. And um, uh, I, I don't tell that story anymore, Allison, because the last time I told it was at a, a law conference uh, in Los Angeles, and several lawyers actually cried. And you're aware that lawyers don't have souls. So if we made lawyers <laughs> cry, then the regular humans you know, really will cry. Um, also, I think the, the classic one is the, the famous um, uh, challenge that Ernest Hemingway had to tell a story in six words. Do you guys know this one? Yeah. yeah so the story is um, for sale, baby shoes never worn. Uh, and it's, it's, that's a, that's a, there's a story arc there, right? So um, there's a mystery, there's a crisis, there's a resolution. Uh, and so, yeah, I, yeah. That, that's two examples. That's great. So, uh, so one of the things we'd also talked about previously was what kind of notoriously nose, di nose dives attention. And I actually used this. It's funny, after we had this conversation, I uh, was asked to have a lead a discussion in a coaching group. And the gentleman who brought me in did this, what felt to me like an endless introduction and then asked me to introduce myself. <laughs> Oh. And, and I remembered our conversation and I'm like, nope, I'm just going to dive in. And so, so what is it about introductions, Paul? What another great question. Uh, so Accenture found this in their data that the only person who cares about the introduction is the person speaking. So, uh, and, and inevitably you get that one dude who's got to go on about his house and his kids and his 14 dogs and like, oh my God, I just want to get to this thing. So yeah, so what Accenture has done in person now is put a, a little, uh, that little tent card with your name. Hey, if, if Allison is interesting, if Luann is interesting, I can talk to them on the break, right? So I think that's a much more effective use of that time. So I, I'm with you, short introduction, let's get to it. And secondly, uh, which we found in our work with entertainment clients, what we call in, in what we, what they call in Hollywood, a hot open. Open hot, right? G give me, give it, get me in there. Don't go, well, it's nice to be here and you know, I've traveled all of this. No, get, get me, get me excited. So again, think of the, the great TED Talks. Um, you know, they, they start out really strong. And so uh, if you, so we did, we did research on, on, on TED Talks just for fun, not mine because, you know, it would be too self-aggrandizing, but we had people, we, we went online and found a list of the best and worst TED Talks and we actually measured immersion while people um, gave them. And, and we showed that if you can increase immersion by 10% in a TED Talk, at least for the sample of data we have, you'd have 176,000 more online views. So really, op so, so make, get me immersed, but also many of those TED Talks that are great open hot, they open with a real mystery, they open with energy. Um, so something I like to do in person is when I go on stage is to run from the wings, run on stage. Let's get that energy up right away. Right, so I want them to know I'm excited about being here. I'm not going to stroll out. Uh, yeah, and it helps me burn off a little of that anxiety or whatever before you go talk. So um, I don't know how to do that on Zoom. I can't run in from the wings on Zoom, but um, like, you know, I don't know. Put some energy into it. I think. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. So other than than uh, you know lo long introductions, what it, what else kind of tends to nosedive connection or or attention? And besides going on too long and introducing yourself, yeah, I think uh, I think many things. One is um, uh, staticness, so um, the the attentional dopamine response in the brain. The brain loves the new new thing. I um, hate to tell you, so um, sitting here, and I'm sitting. You guys are mostly sitting. Like it's better if I'm if I'm standing. I should be standing, but I'm not because uh, I'm super tall, and you can't use camera to see my ceiling. Um, so. Uh, you know, changing things up. So as I said, changing the media, changing the uh, experience, taking questions. Um, I sometimes brought little, uh, I have little squishy brains from our, from our thing. And I'll, uh, if you ask a question, I'll throw you a squishy brain. So now someone's like, what the hell? This guy's on stage throwing brains out in the audience. And so, you know, anything to, to, to change the pace, I think is good, but also not going on too long. Like I am on every possible question you ask me, <laughs> um, you know, allowing people to, to respond. Um, I think having uh, that, that, that change. So think of mixing it up. I think that's the key. So one of the things you're that I've noticed you're really that you're really gracious about, Paul, is like saying that's a great question and you guys are brilliant. I'm curious, and I'm sure that's really sweet, but like is that based on data too? 
Mm. Just based on my own stupid personality, probably. Okay. <laughs> I just like, well, is Colin the is Colin the audience really smart? Does that increase, you know, oxytocin? I'm just curious. Okay, Terry, question. Thanks, Allison. I actually was fortunate to be in the breakout with Paul. So, um, and we were uh, we were starting a conversation that I didn't get to hear his answer to. So, thought maybe I'd ask it in the larger group. Um, in working with clients, sometimes you know, in certain situations, you're realizing that they have these really uh, groove neural pathways, right? Where they just have a way they see the world and the way that it is, and you're trying to work with them to expand to more options so that they can see other alternatives for how they could approach a problem or a situation. I'm just curious for Paul's thoughts on that and what the research might show. Yeah, so so nice to be able to have a one-on-one -on -one in the breakout room. So thanks, Terry, for a great conversation. Um, uh, so the, the sort of bad news for everybody is the brain is a super lazy organ um, in the sense that it takes so much energy to run about 20% of your caloric intake that your brain really wants to idle, just doesn't want to expend energy. So that's why the hot open is important. That's why getting, you know, bouncing people out of their homeostasis is important. So Terry's question is, you know, can, can we actually change these pathways in the brain, change behaviors? And the answer is it's hard because your brain um, kind of optimizes those pathways in the brain. So they're really, really efficient once uh, the, uh, the term of art is potentiated. Once those pathways have been potentiated, they really want to activate. So these, these manifest as habits. So here, again, here's the second practical thing you do. So uh, tonight, when your dear loving a spouse or roommate complains about something you do, and you say, you know, they say to you, honey, you know, I told you a hundred times not to leave your dirty dishes in the sink. And you say, oh, sweet person that I love, I would love to change this behavior, but my lazy, lazy brain has gotten used to the 45 years of my life putting my dirty dishes in the sink as opposed to the dishwasher. So how do you change that? And it's exactly what, what Terry's job is, lots of your jobs, which is coaching. So you need to coach this person. So it's constant reminder. So the day they look like at least 90 days of practice on this new skill or behavior with feedback, right? The feedback part's important. That's where your jobs are really critical in my view. You've got to give that person feedback. So they're giving this, this uh, constant reinforcement. So at home, you know, you tell your spouse or your roommate, for 90 days, you got to remind nicely, remind me, just, just, you know, be my kind of nag me nicely. So I do this new thing and then I can help establish new pathways in the brain. And then those, those will become default. So I think this is where coaching is really, really important is to move you from this kind of maladaptive set of defaults that you had into this new default, which is going to be better. That will better serve you. Cool. Thank you. So one of the, oh, I see your hand, Roger, go ahead. Sorry, uh, Paul, a quick question. Uh, are there any examples of TED speakers uh, that you would say, here's a wonderful example of somebody who quickly got to the heart of what they're talking about and, and then connected with what people may be interested in in that subject? Uh, I, I learned by example. <laughs> Yeah. I, I know um, a couple if you don't. <laughs> go ahead, Allison. I, oh, I have a couple, Jill, but you, you go. Jill Bolte Taylor. OMG. She, you know, like I, I am a longtime TEDx uh, conference organizer and I've coached hundreds of TED speakers, not hundreds, dozens of TED speakers. And that's one of the ones I point to. What would you say, Paul? Um, I, I can just tell you the ones that, uh, yeah, I'm, first of all, I'm I go to TED regularly too, and I'm terrible because I critique everybody. For, hey, can you believe it? Like, so, so first of all, Roger, like don't bury the lead, right? So you hit me hard with the big mystery, just like you would do in storytelling. Um, I'm not really a fan of this guy, though other, a lot of people are. Uh, Tony Robbins has an amazing TED Talk, and he's the one person I've ever seen who uh, Chris Anderson let go longer than 18 minutes. And I think he did it on purpose. He set up a really big crisis and then his clock ran out and then Chris like hey time's up and he goes well does the audience want to know how this how this ends <laughs> like that's a heck of a hook right think about that so uh, but Roger's question was sort of starting uh you know really hot so I can't think of one off the top of my head um sorry well, yeah so so one of my favorites and I have that so is uh um gave his talk on my TED stage it was uh, Simon Sinek you know he he I organized the 
uh, TEDx Puget Sound, which he spoke at. And so he, it's one of the top, I think he's the number four TED talk of all time, um, of all time. And so he, that's what I was attracted me to him when I looked at him as a speaker to put on the, the docket and he does not fail to deliver. Thank you. Um, Kate Peters, would you be open to, to speaking about your comment? You know, one of the things that, uh, questions that we've gotten is like, how do I create a virtual experience that's as much like an in-person experience as possible? And Kate, it sounds like you've had a good experience there. Will you speak to that? Okay, yeah, sure, happy to. Um, I love hearing this, Paul. This is just uh, what we just did. We, we only, we broke it up into, we did a, a, a four session uh, coaching on communications. And there were two facilitators, um, both in my company. And um, we broke it up into really 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minute segments. And, um, and we did games, we did uh, polling, we did, if they created a word cloud as part of a game. And, um, you know, we went through all the typical material that we do. And we're both performers originally. So we're used to being in front of a group and, you know, kind of making it lots of fun. And, um, and so it, it, it wasn't working on online. So we did a lot of research and said, okay, break it up. Let's do that. And we got the best results we ever have. People wanted more. Um, they, um, they responded beautifully. And I think they learned more than they did in the uh, in-person session. So I'm totally a fan of all of this. It, it works. Well done, Kate. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Paul, anything you, any final um, comments here at the end of our conversation? Yeah, I, I think Kate's got it nailed. I think it is kind of edutainment. It, it's got to be entertaining. It's got to have a story. It's got, you've got to give me a reason to care because my lazy brain just wants to, to idle and, um, and, and really have authentic emotion, right? So you, you as a presenter can share those probably amazing stories you all have of working with um, you know, uh, executives or whomever in which you really did a life-changing experience. So I think starting with that story is still very, very valuable. Nice. Well, that was terrific, Paul. We're just going to close by saying if you'd like more information about Paul, you can find out more about him at these locations. He just put, I noticed a, a link to his blog on TED Talks, which is awesome. So check that out and check out his TED Talk too. It's really pretty great.